Here's a little real estate reality from me, a Century 21 affiliated agent. Looking for your perfect home? You should look for your perfect agent first. Most people spend more time picking a restaurant than a real estate agent. That's why we encourage you to browse through ratings and reviews on Century21.com so you can find an agent who will put 121% of their effort into finding your next home. Century 21. Move fearlessly. Each office is independently owned and operated. Century 21 is a registered trademark owned by Century 21 Real Estate, LLC. You're listening to Away With Words, the show about language and how we use it. I'm Grant Barrett. And I'm Martha Barnett. Well, it seems everybody's talking about the weather, particularly in places that are really hot. And I've been tired of saying the same things over and over, but I've found a couple of handy new words that uh, I'm going to start using. One of them is from the Scottish National Dictionary, and it's obsolete, but I think it's high time to bring it back. That word is glorgy. G-L-O-R-G-Y. Glorgy. Glorgy. Glorg. This sounds like a Scandinavian alcoholic drink that the Vikings had. <laughs> this is what they feed. This is what they serve you at Valhalla, right? Well, that might help you cool <laughs> off glorgy. when the weather is glorgy because glorgy means sultry. And uh, the Scottish National Dictionary says it's applied to a warm, suffocating day with a darkened sun. So oh. it was a glorgy simmers afternoon. Probably comes from an old word meaning soft mud. And the other word that I really love is pothery, P-O-T-H-E-R-Y, pothery. It means humid, sultry, or close. It's an English dialectal term, and uh, I really like it. It's pothery out there. It's too pothery to do anything. You keep using the word sultry, but this isn't the sexy sultry, is it? No, no, (laughs) no. This is the sweltering sultry. In fact, I think those two words are etymologically related, sweltering and sultry. Yeah, yeah. It's about the the heat sultry. That's Mm -hmm. where their connection lies. Mm -hmm. Well, you're reminding me that when the heat comes on, we look forward to the cooler months. And there's a a rhyming calendar put together by the... Irish-English politician and dramatist Richard Sheridan, uh, born in 1751. And it goes like this. It's January snowy, February flowy, March blowy, April showery, May flowery, June bowery, July moppy, August (laughs) croppy, September poppy, October breezy, November wheezy, December freezy. I like July moppy in particular because maybe you live where it rains a lot and you need to mop it up, but also yeah. maybe you live where it's really humid yeah. and you're just tripping. You're mopping July your brow. moppy. <laughs> I also like September poppy. Is that when poppies bloom or is it you know when the air know. gets crisp and the sky looks bright blue? Maybe it's the uh, popping the the melons off the vine then. I'm not really sure. <laughs> oh, could be that. <laughs> we'll put that on the website so you guys can share that, put that up in the classroom. We'd love to hear your special words for the weather. 877-929-9673. Toll free in the U.S. and Canada. Email words at waywardradio.org or Twitter at W-A-Y-W-O-R-D. Hello, you have a way with words. Hi, this is Sydney. I'm calling from Boston. From Boston. Welcome to the show, Sydney. What can we do for you? So I I don't remember what I was reading, but I was reading the word naive, and it, like, stuck in my craw somehow because of the two little dots on top of the I, and I could not get over, it's not a letter, like, I don't think I've ever seen those two little eyes before, on to- or the two little dots on top of an eye before, and so I guess my question is just, like, Why? <laughs> <laughs> The word naive, N-A-I-V-E, and there are two dots over the I? Yeah, exactly. Where were you reading this, Sydney? I I do have a little bit of the habit of reading The New Yorker, and I know that I've seen it. Mm. Like, they do it a lot. Right. And I don't know if it's connected because I see it there often on the O, which is also annoying because, to my knowledge, I don't think, like, O with the two little dots is an English letter. So very confused. So you're annoyed by those two little dots when you see them occasionally over vowels. I think that's an understatement to say that I'm annoyed. (laughs) (laughs) They're sometimes called diaresis. That's D-I-A-E-R-E-S-I-S, diaresis. I was thinking of the ancient Greek word it comes from, uh, which means division. This diacritical mark that you see occasionally goes all the way back to ancient Greek. And the reason that they used it in ancient Greek is that originally Greek was written without spaces between words, if you can imagine that. 
And hmm. so those little dots were helpful at the beginning of the word if you had two or more vowels crashing up against each other. It, it would just get confusing otherwise. In English, it's sometimes called a trema, T-R-E-M-A, uh, which comes from a Greek word meaning perforation, which I really like, you know, just a little perforation on the page. You see it in French occasionally in words like naive and naivete, which is why we see that sometimes in English. You also see it in uh, words like Noel, which was adopted into English and sometimes on Christmas cards, you know, it, it mm. looks kind of pretty to see that little perforation. And occasionally you'll see it in English names like Zoe or the name of the Bronte sisters, uh, Charlotte, Emily, oh, yeah. and Anne. It's really died out in English except, as you noted, in The New Yorker, which stubbornly holds on to that diacritical mark for words like cooperate or re-elect uh, because... Um, when they were developing the style of the New Yorker early in the 20th century, they felt that that was an elegant solution to the problem of those vowels bumping up against each other. And Sydney, I have to recommend at this point a wonderful book by Mary Norris about her years working in the copy department at the New Yorker. She wrote a book called Between You and Me, Confessions of a Comma Queen. And in that book, she acknowledges that uh, the use of the diaresis is the number one complaint from readers. So you have lots of company. <laughs> but what's also really interesting about that is that um, she relates a story from her predecessor in the copy department who agreed with you that the diaresis really isn't necessary, that it that is kind of fussy. And Mary Norris's predecessor told her that she used to pester the style editor then, who had been there since 1928. And one day in the elevator, he mentions to Mary's predecessor, you know, I think it's time to make a change. We need to get rid of this. And I'm going to send out a memo telling people not to use it anymore. And then he died. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and Mary says, "And Mary says this was in 1978. No one has had the nerve to raise the subject since." Oh, that is incredible, and I feel like it like it affirms for me that there's something a little bit like fancy pants about it, which is both <laughs> annoying, but I can appreciate. But then I also feel like English like asks so much of us in terms of like through and though, and like none of our spelling makes any sense, and so I feel like. If we're only going to use this on a couple of words, like why not just drop it and expect people to learn that naive is pronounced that way? I don't know. But don't don't you <laughs> yeah, see that the, the <laughs> diaresis is providing a clue to pronunciation? Though it's one of the few places that you can be helpful. So you don't pronounce a word like cooperative, like cooperative. You don't say Bronte like Bront. But I agree with Sydney. I mean, these are things you can just learn and move on. Okay. But yeah, I'd love to hear more about what you think about that, Sydney, now that you've heard all that history. I am fascinated by the connection to ancient Greek. I uh, am a devotee of Sappho, and so it's very fun to hear that there's that connection. I just remembered um, what I was reading when I found it in. I don't know if it's helpful to tell you now, but it was, it was sure. a really great book, and I definitely recommend it. It was um, The Priory of the Orange Tree by Samantha Shannon. It's fantasy. It's got dragons in it. Highly recommend Oh, I'm for okay. it. All for it. I'll check it out. Thank you for the recommendation, Sydney. And thank you so much for your call. We really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. This was really fun. Take care okay. of yourself. Thanks. Yep, you too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. So the diaresis says, pronounce this vowel, and the umlaut says, pronounce this vowel differently. Right. An umlaut looks just the same, but it's not. An umlaut is German. Yeah, an umlaut appears in German and, and will change the sound of a vowel, like sometimes when you're when you're uh, switching from singular to plural. Oh, perfect. Give us a call with your language questions, thoughts, and ideas. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, toll free in the United States and Canada, 877-929-9673. Hello, you have a way with words. Hi, this is Sarah, and I am from Yorktown, Virginia. Welcome. What can we do for you? So years ago, I moved from Yorktown, Virginia to Santa Cruz, California, I was 14, so I was pretty young. Um, the most memorable thing about moving out there was the language and how different it was. Hearing all their slang words was like the coolest thing for me. Um, but the word that 
is stuck with me is barge. So this word was used like when people would go skate for a long distance or go on a really far bike ride or go from one party to the next, um, a really far travel. And they would say, man, that was such a barge. Or we just barged across town or um, something along those lines. Um, I don't know barge very much. comes up in a couple lists of Santa Cruz slang. One list from 2013 and another from 2017. They basically define it like you do to mean a a long distance or a large distance. Um, There is, uh, in a list of slang from UCLA from 2009, put together by the Department of Linguistics there, to barge it. Uh, go means to go quickly. I wonder if that's related. Um, mm-hmm. And then there's a snowboarding dictionary that has barge, which is glossed as going for it with all you've got. Mm. And all of these vaguely feel related to me because they're all about doing what it takes to uh, just to pass through this this obstacle, you know, a large distance. Yeah. You just got to so you got to ride the board to go the distance or ride the bike to go the distance. I don't know. So you think it's definitely like more just like slang kind of um, terminology? Yeah, I think it might come from the board sports, actually. I don't know enough about it. And frankly, the uh, some of the slang is so ephemeral, it just lasts for a little while and then disappears. My first instinct with barge, though, would be other barge slang. Barge meaning a large vehicle, like a, not a boat, but a car. The giant Cadillacs, you know, the the big sedans from the 80s, you know, the ones that you inherit from your grandparents <laughs> that have a little life left in them. And you and your teen friends pile in with your skateboards and your your gear and your whatever stuff you need to go to the beach, your coolers and your dogs and whatever. And that's your barge, you know. My husband had one. He's from Santa Cruz and he had a exactly You know what, what I'm describing. talking about then. Oh, okay. yeah, These are exactly. It's like driving a building. <laughs> a building <Yeah>. with wheels. <laughs> well, thank you guys so much for having me. It was a pleasure, and I look forward to calling again with many more Oh, yeah, do share. We'd love to hear more about Santa Cruz as a 14-year-old. That must have been an amazing time for you. Beach culture. Oh, we could Ugh. spend hours on the phone. I have stories for days. <laughs> <laughs> well, call us again. <laughs> All right. Be well. Take care. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. You know, something tells me we have lots of listeners who have lots of stories about exactly that kind of thing, that big, long road trip that your family took when you were younger and and you encountered different foods or different language. We'd love to hear about it. Call us, 877-929-9673, or send those stories to words at waywardradio.org. More about what you say and why you say it. Stick around for more of Away With Words. This episode is brought to you by DirecTV Stream. DirecTV Stream brings you the live TV you love. That means you can stay up to the minute on 24-hour live news, from entertainment to current events, wherever you are in the U.S., whether that's at home, on your TV, or streaming on the go. And you get your favorite live sports, so you can catch this season's biggest games. Get the best of live TV with DirecTV Stream. Get your TV together at directtv.com. You're listening to Away With Words, the show about language and how we use it. I'm Martha Barnett. And I'm Grant Barrett, and here he is, uh, buckling under the weight of mounds of trivia laden index cards it's our quiz guide john chinesky hi john hi grant hi martha yes you can't beat the old school way of doing trivia on index cards that's how i like to do it flip 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 here we go oh here's one this is perfect let's do this one i love getting hooked on tv shows that expose me to a world of language now i've been an actor for a long time but i've never worked in a restaurant so i'm really enjoying the bear which takes place in a chicago kitchen it's chock full of kitchen slang. So I created this quiz. I fired this quiz. Fire means to get a dish cooking. Now, I'll make up a sentence you might hear in a professional kitchen, and I'll substitute a synonym or a phrase for the kitchen slang. You give me the word or phrase I'm looking for. 
Uh, for example, if I said, I have two people coming in, better clean up that low card, the answer would be deuce, which is a term for a table that seats two, oh. and low card is a deuce. Okay? Uh, not a, yeah. a two-top? Yeah, or a two-top. You can say, uh, call it a two-top, sure. Now, some of these you may already know, and some you can probably figure out. So here we go. Order up. Could you possibly get me some help here? I'm really among the invasive plants. <laughs> uh, in the kutsu? <laughs> in the weeds. <laughs> in the weeds, yes. In the weeds means really busy in a kitchen. Now, we're out of anchovies, so 2 times 43, that pesto special. <laughs> 86 86 86 remove it yeah uh look there's a restaurant critic over there be sure to treat a surfboard that table wax yes if you (laughs) wax the table you give it special treatment like if the owner's family is there or something that's really good i i finished that steak order for table 12 it's waiting for you on the football throw pass Pass, yeah, that's the name for the the window, the pass through window that they put the orders mm. on. The pass. Mm. Oh, hey, table twelve sent back that steak and fries. It's a perished dish. Do you want a few fries? It's it's burned, right? Something like that. Mm, close. Pa- dead. Yes. Dead. Okay. Dead and a synonym for dish. Dead plate. Yeah, dead, dead plate. Hmm. A dead plate is unservable dish. Somebody sent it back, or there's something with it. You know, sometimes the kitchen staff will. You know, maybe take a fry or two. Ah. Yeah. Look, I don't care if you're in a hurry. Your uniform needs to be clean if you're going out on the level. Floor? Yes, the floor Mm. is the dining room itself. And people who work in the kitchen have to be neat if they're going out on the floor. Thanks to the movie premiere across the street, we had a ton of lids last night. Covers. Top? Covers, yes. Oh. <laughs> covers covers uh, means customers. Uh. Very good. I think you guys are ready to uh, get to work, you know, so, you know, strap on an apron and, and get to it. <laughs> That's fantastic. John, I hope you'll join us for the family meal. You know what that is? That's when the staff makes food for the people who work there when the customers aren't around. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, John. And we hope you'll join us. Just pull up a chair to talk about language, 877-929-9673, or send your questions and stories about language to words at waywardradio.org. Hello. Welcome to Away With Words. Thank you. My name is Luciano Morale. I am calling from Augusta, Kentucky, uh, but I am a Cuban uh, a man that came from uh, from Cuba in uh, 1962. Uh, Augusta is my my home now. And it is a beautiful town right on the the Ohio River. What's on your mind, Luciano? Well, uh, listening to your program about uh, the different ideas of of the way um, people talk about raining when it rains and the sun shines. And... uh, so happens that in Cuba, when it rains and the sun is shining, they say that the devil's daughter is getting married. But years ago, I worked at a restaurant that belonged to uh, Trudy Siebel, better known as Trudy Russell at that time. And uh, it was the Forest View Gardens in Cincinnati. I was a cook there, and they were the people that raised me. And she was also my voice teacher because I'm an opera singer. And she um, and the lady that worked there with me was called Mildred Battle. And I mentioned to her that the devil's daughter was getting married because the sun was shining. And Mildred Battle was from Alabama, an African-American woman. And she says, oh, no, no, the devil's daughter is getting beaten. So I found that very, very amazing that the, the correlation between the people in Cuba and the people in Alabama had this connection. My question was, do you think that this idea came from the slaves that came from Africa to the New World, or was it something that Europeans used to say? Wow, you've, you've got the whole story there, Luciano. Yeah, give us a Spanish for that. It would be something like, uh, La hija del diablo se está casando. Mm-hmm. Se está casando. 
Yeah, and it means the devil's daughter is getting married. But then you had a friend who said, oh, no, 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 it's not that. It's that the devil is beating his wife. That's that right, it? Mildred Bottle. She mm -hmm. was from Alabama. When I said this, she says, oh, no, 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 the devil is beating his daughter. <laughs> and I, since then I've been thinking, well, how does these two things happen to come together? And, and it has to be something that must have been brought from Africa by the slaves, you know, that came to work in Cuba. Well, Luciano, what's really interesting about those two expressions is that they are part of a huge family of expressions from all over the world um, involving uh, those sun showers is what I call them, you know, when, the, when it's raining while the sun is still shining. And all of these expressions, some involving the devil and some involving other things, they all suggest that something very rare and supernatural is happening. But they're not all as grim as the one that your friend described, the devil is beating his wife. In Mexico, actually, sometimes they say, las conejas están pariendo. <laughs> The have rabbits are giving birth. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're having babies. <laughs> yeah. Have you heard that one before? Nunca. Never, never did Nunca. I listen to that. <laughs> or, or in Puerto Rico, they say, están casando una bruja. The, they are marrying a witch. <laughs> yes. I, I never heard that either. <laughs> these, so, Martha, these are all over the world. We're not just in talking Spanish-speaking or English-speaking cultures, right? Right. Um, in Korea, it's tigers are getting married. In, in Bulgaria, it's bears are getting married. Uh, in really? some Arabic-speaking countries, rats are getting married. And, and if you go to South Africa, you'll hear people talk about a monkey's wedding. And, you know, they look out the window and they say, oh, it's a monkey's wedding, meaning wow. the monkeys are getting married because it's this weird supernatural uh, event that's happening. Well, that's very cool. Thank you so much for sharing that expression. I certainly enjoy, and I love your program. Oh, thank you so much. Thanks uh, for calling. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. 877 929 Here's another handy weather word. That word is claggy, C-L-A-G-G-Y. Any idea what claggy is, Grant? Uh, is this got to be another Scots word? Uh, it's it's regional around the UK. Oh, around regional Britain. around claggy. Claggy. Oh, so uh, I think this is so cloudy that you um, <laughs> stay inside, stick your head out the window, and shout at the weather. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. There, there are elements of that in the definition. In, in... The weather's so bad, you just shout at it. I don't know. <laughs> well, it it uh, originally meant a thick, low-level cloud, damp and overcast, foggy and misty. But it has also come to mean unpleasantly close and humid, and that's oh, what yeah. I like. It's it's from an old word having to do with sticky things. So similar know. to muggy. Yeah, yeah. I hate this sticky, claggy weather. It's not conducive for sleeping. Muggy, by the way, isn't one of those terms that everyone knows in the English-speaking world. It's more common in the U.S. Is that right? Yeah. I didn't know that. I guess they're talking about things being claggy mm -hmm. <laughs> over there. 877-929-9673. Hi, you have a way with words. Hi, my name is Melanie, and I'm calling from San Antonio. Hey, Melanie. Welcome. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I am calling about the word janky. I don't know when I started using it. I believe it was when I lived in California, but my family and I use it for pretty much everything. It means something that's, you know, not good, not working well. But we would even use it to the point where when the dogs were dirty, she would say, please, de the dogs. And I knew exactly <laughs> what that meant. <laughs> I'm going to borrow that one. <laughs> de -jankify. No, it works really well because that's not a full bat. They're just janky. They're not dirty. They're just janky. Oh, okay. So, <laughs> All right. So that's not like a dog that's been skunked. <laughs> no, not that bad. That would need a bath, not a de jankification. <laughs> de -jankification. So. Janky. So J A N K Y. Yes, that's how I would spell it. Uh, and you picked it up in California. Do you remember about when? I guess it would have to have been 10 years ago because I've been in Texas for eight. But okay. people in Texas seem to know what I'm saying. And I could be exaggerating that timeline. It could have been Texas, but the dogs that were janky were mostly living in California. So that's why I think. Well, it's, it's been <laughs> around long enough. I think that people, it's got a 
pretty widespread usage across the country, so you could have picked it up anywhere. I don't know that it's ever been regional janky. It first pops up in the late 1980s. I did an entry for it in one of my books in the mid-2000s, and I was able to take it back to the early 1990s. And then the Oxford English Dictionary did an entry later, and they were able to take it back even further. But you'll find it spelled as jinky. Um, you'll find it spelled as uh, J-I-N-J-A-N-K-I-E, J-A-N-K-E-Y. And the belief is, from people who've looked at this word, is it's probably a blend of junky and influenced by things like skanky um, mm. and stanky. S-T-A-N-K-Y. Okay. You know, that kind of slangy way of saying stinky. Oh, yeah. I've definitely said stanky, so that makes sense. So stanky <laughs> plus junky plus skanky gets you janky. And Melanie, I think you're right that people can probably guess what it means just from hearing the word itself and, and hearing it in use. I mean, it's it sort of suggests yeah. what it is, doesn't it? It does, almost like an onomatopoeia, but yeah, so it's mm-hmm. like... Mm-hmm. And the combination of the words makes more sense because I'm like, it's definitely not a jank, like a mechanical jank or anything. <laughs> so that makes perfect sense. But there are some like nuances to it, too, because a, a janky machine isn't necessarily a dirty machine. A janky machine is one that doesn't work well, right? Yeah, but I say janky when things don't work well, too, sometimes. So if a janky chair could be clean right. but broken. Ah. Well, that's, yeah. You're right, exactly. But <laughs> also, but you could have a janky, something that's brand new and janky might just mean it's like a knockoff or a cheap version of the real thing. Yeah, yeah. Right? Or if you go into a restaurant and it's like not all it's cracked up to be, you know, like they charge you extra for for salsa, you know, <laughs> like this JK yeah, restaurant yeah, that's charges janky. me three dollars for salsa. <laughs> what? <laughs> that's illegal. No. <laughs> it's the best word. Now that I'm realizing, I guess I use it too much, and that's why I was so curious about it. But everything you're uh, saying, keep, I think I've used it in that context. <laughs> keep doing it. Keep rolling. Yeah, it's great. You have my permission. I'll send you I a certificate. Will. Yeah, and thank you for de-jankification. <laughs> yeah, de-jankification is good Anytime. Form. Maybe that'll be added one day. <laughs> All right. Melanie, take care of yourself. You too. Y'all have a great one. Thanks so much. Bye. All right. Thanks, Melanie. Bye. Give us a call to talk about language, 877-929-9673, or send your story to us in email. The address is words at waywardradio.org. Hello. You have a way with words. Hi, uh, this is Nick Valenziano in Palm Springs. Hi, Nick. Welcome to the show. A couple of weeks ago, you were talking about talking with someone who was asking about different expressions and where they come from. And it was about, I think, sort of when somebody was finished with the subject, you know, how to move on from it. And you asked for other suggestions or other terms like that. And the one that came to my mind was one that's puzzled me for a long time. Um, when you're really tired of a subject or somebody's just beating a dead horse or you they're trying to get you to give another chance to a restaurant or a a relationship even, and then when you've just had it, you say, been there, done that, bought the T-shirt. Been there, done that, bought the T-shirt? Bought the T-shirt, yeah. And the first part of it makes perfect sense to me, but the bought the T-shirt just seems... Oh, like an odd, an odd little add-on. <laughs> yeah, what's on that T-shirt? <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Well, and you know, if the implication is that okay, we've been to this show before, we've been to this rodeo before. Um, mm-hmm. Well, why didn't you buy the refrigerator magnet or the souvenir <laughs> ashtray? Why the T-shirt? Um, been there, done that was circulating in Australia. Um, by the late 1970s, you know, been there, done that. And alongside that, or a little bit after, there was this growing trend uh, in this country, for sure, of uh, offering a T-shirt as a souvenir for being present Mm. for an event or participating in an event. I have some old uh, 5K and 10K T-shirts that I got Mm -hmm. from running in a road race and, uh, you know, or or going to a concert or visiting a place. Mm -hmm. And in the early 1990s, there were um, advertising campaigns for Diet Mountain Dew and Pepsi Max. It involved daring feats of, you know, these young guys who were base jumping off the rim of the Grand Canyon. And these young guys are like 
did it, done it, been there, tried that. So the idea was, so what? And then, as I said, there was also this trend of, of T-shirts memorializing this and that. By 1982, you see people getting uh, T-shirts that say, my parents went to New York, and all I got was this stupid T-shirt. <laughs> oh, yeah. You can find that, actually, in, in the 70s, even. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Okay. Okay. I, I remember seeing newspaper articles where people were mentioning this kind of uh, locution, like it was cool and new and clever. But uh, anyway, so there are lots of different variations of that, been there, done that bought the t-shirt been there done that got the t-shirt or worn the t-shirt got the t-shirt going home have the t-shirt won the trophy so <laughs> so they're kind of those two similar threads going on at the same time but your elaboration of it has been there done that bought the t-shirt is that what it is bought the t-shirt got bought the t-shirt the something one of those uh -huh. variations uh-huh but that that does uh, shed some light on it and uh I keep coming up with all kinds of questions for you guys. You do a great job, and uh, I always enjoy it. Thank you so much, Nick, for the compliments, and thank you for the call. We really appreciate it. Yeah, call us again sometime. Stay cool there in Palm Springs. Uh, I definitely will. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> all right. Bye-bye. 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 Australia, you've got something else to be proud of. <laughs> What's funny, in the United States, the first time I really saw it pop up when I was digging into this was Lauren Tweez, who played Julie, the cruise director, on the TV show The Love Boat. Yeah. She used the expression, been there, done that, uh, when she was talking about having been married before in a newspaper article, and she calls it an Australian expression. So it, it's perfect. And then there, not long after, there's a, an athlete who also says, I got this from Australia. How interesting. Because, you know, there is this older catchphrase in Britain from the late 19th and early 20th century, been and gone and done it, and that usually refers to marriage. Been and gone oh, and done it. So I don't know if there's a it. connection or not, but oh, cool. Oh, interesting. So we might have another fork in the road. We More might. More work to be done, as always. <laughs> <laughs> 24 hours a day, seven days a week, toll free in the U.S. and Canada, 877-929-9673. I've talked about terms for hot weather, but here's one that I really like that involves cold weather that just makes me feel better saying it. It's silver thaw. Silver thaw, particularly in Oregon and Washington State, refers to freezing rain that coats everything with ice. Isn't that beautiful? Silver oh, thaw. Oh, that really is. I've seen mm. those uh, ice storms in Missouri where literally yeah. everything looks like a, a tree that's been perfectly decorated with tinsel. Yes, yes. And that's what we called them back east, uh, an ice storm. But I thought it was interesting that in the Pacific Northwest, it's called Silver Thaw. Silver Thaw. Gorgeous. 877-929-9673. Facebook is taking action to keep its platform safe. In the last six years, Facebook spent over $16 billion, enough to build seven pro stadiums, all to help create safer connections. Learn more about the work ahead at facebook.com forward slash action. You're listening to Away With Words, the show about language and how we use it. I'm Grant Barrett. And I'm Martha Barnett. If you need more evidence that language is constantly changing, look no further than American Sign Language, or ASL. Decades ago, people used to use those old-fashioned candlestick phones, and so the sign for telephone at that time was one fist at your mouth and another one at your ear, imitating what the phone looked like. And over time, deaf people adopted the sign that many hearing people use, too, that familiar pinky and thumb up to the side of your head, the one that looks like, call me. But now that term is evolving again, and increasingly, people who use ASL will sign the word phone just by curving the fingers of one hand and holding it up to their ear like they're holding an invisible cell phone. And another thing that's really interesting about how sign language is evolving is the fact that because there's so much communication over video these days, a lot of times the signs that are used by younger people are shrinking to accommodate that smaller space on the screen, on the phone or on the computer. For example, instead of the old sign for dog, which is tapping your thigh as if to call a dog over to you, it's just a flick of the fingers. It's just signing the letters D and G, which doesn't take up that much space. It's really fascinating to see how that is changing and developing. You mentioned uh, that 
telephone sign switching from a two-handed sign to a one-handed sign. Mm -hmm. And that is, by the way, one of the very common ways that dialects of sign languages differ. A lot of times uh, there'll be a two-handed sign and a one-handed version of Mm -hmm. it that Mm -hmm. can vary from place to place within the sign language community. And sometimes it's done for expediency where... A two-handed sign is difficult if you're carrying something or if you uh, are in a workplace and a one-handed sign is more necessary. Mm. So a one-handed sign develops because of that. And then you talked about the signing space of a of an online video conference or an online video presentation. Yeah, signing TikTok. space also is something that's commonly differentiates dialects. So, for example, African American sign language or black sign language tends to have a larger signing space whereas non-black sign language tends to have a smaller signing space. And so you will see this as well being one of the places that even outside of language change, we can see these dialects forming just by looking at the signing space, how wide the, the horizontal and vertical space is, and even where they put signs to temporarily hold them out of the conversation. They'll literally take a subject and kind of temporarily move it outside of their signing space to go back and get it later, kind of like a referent. Oh, I didn't know that. That's fascinating. Yeah. So there's it's all very inter- Yeah, it is interesting. If you ever get a chance to see a linguist speak on sign language, do it because they understand that the community is very interested and they're interested in bringing in people to acknowledge that this is a real language with rules, it's systematic, and people use it in everyday lives. If you'd like to see some great talks and read some great papers written on sign language, look for the name Seal Lucas, C-E-I-L-L-U-C-A-S. She is an American linguist talking and writing and studying and, and explaining sign language to the community and teaching about sign language. And so she's got some good stuff. If you'd like to talk to us about language or share your ideas or thoughts, 877-929-9673. Hello, you have a way with words. Hi, how are you? Uh, my name is Nathan. I'm calling from Dallas. Uh, well, I had a specific question about uh, the word I. It's uh, one of the only two single letter words in English I can think of, the other being just A. But we capitalize it. And it's the, as far as I can tell, it, grammatically it's the first person singular pronoun. And uh, mm-hmm. I know in Spanish and in, and in Russian, they don't, they don't capitalize that pronoun. So I'm wondering why English does. So the pronoun I, just the letter I, not the E-Y-E, not the part of your body. Right, right. Well, first of all, you're right, Nathan, that uh, the capitalized first-person pronoun apparently appears only in English. Uh, As you noted, Romance languages, like like French, for example, they leave all the the, uh, personal pronouns lowercase. And then there are other um, languages that don't even use capitalized letters, like Hebrew and Arabic. So English pretty much stands alone. And the reason, as far as we can tell, is simply that that I is so thin, so skinny, um, that it's easy to confuse it. It's a matter of visual clarity um, why we we capitalize the I. Um, It wasn't always the case. Um, In Old English, the word for I was spelled I-C and pronounced itch or each. And then eventually the C fell off. Um, You still see it in German, of course, ich. But um, by the 13th century, people started capitalizing that I when they were using the first person pronoun. And then that got codified later with uh, the printing press, of course. So it's really a matter of just not confusing that with, with uh, you know, a smear on the page or something. <laughs> the other thing that happened with the letter I, the, the little I, you know, the, the small I, um, we added a little dot on the top called a tittle, that little dot oh, on the top of the I. Yeah, so, it, so it's really a matter of just being able to see it and distinguish it from other letters or other things on the page. There was even a period in there where, in some words, the lowercase I was replaced with a lowercase Y. Mm -hmm. just to make it clear what was meant and how it was to be pronounced. Of course, a lot of this was before spelling was regularized. You wouldn't cause anyone anger because you misspelled the word. They'd be like, oh, okay, that makes a lot of sense. I I now know what you meant. Just so easy for the lowercase i just to get lost. It looks like an upstroke or a downstroke of so many other letters. If you're writing, you know, with a, a pen or calligraphy. 
yeah, absolutely. Okay, well, that makes a lot of sense, I suppose. Well, Nathan, you raise a really good question. It is really weird that English is pretty much the only language that capitalizes its first-person pronoun. And it's nothing to do with ego, by the way. Some some yeah. people like to say, oh, it's just because <laughs> Anglophones are very egotistical. Not in the least. I mean, we might be, but the I isn't the evidence of that. <laughs> okay, good to know. <laughs> Take care. Thanks for calling, Nathan. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Well, we would like you to call us at 877-929-9673 with your questions, thoughts, and ideas about language. Or you can email us, words at waywardradio.org. Another weather word that's used in the UK and that's only been around since the 1990s is the word mafting, M-A-F-T-I-N-G, mafting, mafting hot weather is oppressively hot weather. That sounds like a minced oath. It sounds like uh, somebody who... Uh, <laughs> they're or an the, acronym. <laughs> well, they're on television, yeah. <laughs> Just uh, oppressively hot. It can also be used as a verb, like I was mafting in the bright sunshine because I was wearing too many shirts or whatever. Oh, so this is, it's so hot that you're evaporating. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's it. You're wafting Your molecules downward. are dissipating into the atmosphere. <laughs> Mafting, mafting oh, hot. That's good. Oh, here's a tweet that I really liked. I don't think my house could maft more if it was given a mafting award from the School of Mafting. <laughs> <laughs> now that's a hot house. <laughs> that's a hot house. <laughs> oh, yeah. Share your weather tweets with us at W A Y W O R D. Hello, you have a way with words. Hi, this is Lanessa from. Presently, San Antonio, soon to be somewhere else. <laughs> How are you? Okay. <laughs> are you? Do you know where? We're transitioning. We are moving from San Antonio to L.A. It's a big trip. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, that's a big trip. Okay, so my mom, uh, my grandmother, and grandfather were originally from Tennessee. He was in the, the Army. He would come uh, back from work. He would work on a refrigeration truck or, or mechanics and, and whatnot, and he would, uh, one time I heard my grandma say at that, at that side door that led into her pristine kitchen, she said, Henry, what in the tarnation? You don't have any gumption. Don't come walking into my kitchen like that. Leave your brogans at the door. <laughs> oh, I was a little my. kid, you know. <laughs> I was like, That's a lot of stuff. Yeah, but that'll blow your hair back. <laughs> right so as a kid I was like brogans that's just I'm like and, and I, I looked at his shoes and they were just boots you know yeah. some sort of boots or I don't even think they were military boots or anything like that but um, they were definitely shop boots and they didn't they weren't allowed in the kitchen <laughs> Right, right. Her pristine kitchen. <laughs> oh, and I'm not kidding. She kept that house <laughs> so nice all the time. So. Yeah, very house proud. I can imagine. And this was where? This is in Tennessee, Nashville. There's three words in there that catch the ear, right? It's tarnation, gumption, and brokens. Let's kind of break those down in reverse order. So brokens, as you know, are, it's a kind of work shoe or boot. Um, interestingly, this is a, a word of Scots-Irish origin and it comes from a word that is in both Irish and Scots Gaelic, and it means a small brogue. And a brogue is a leather outdoor shoe, and it has perforated ornamentations. These days, a brogue is a nice man's shoe, but it could also be a rough work shoe back in the day. And interestingly okay. enough, this is probably where we get the term brogue referring to an accent. So some people might talk about an Irish brogue or a Scots brogue. Um, oh, which wow. makes a lot of sense because you think about those those accents kind of being bedecked with ornamentation, right? But but sturdy, <laughs> just like the shoe. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. <laughs> wow, you guys really find things. I I thought it was alluding to a military shoe, so but I seriously don't remember which shoe it was, and I was like, well, who knows? I love to go even deeper than just a military shoe or <laughs> whatnot. Brogan is especially more common in the American South, in the U.S. South. Um, okay. And really, in the beginning, it was a coarse, heavy leather work shoe, kind of tied mm -hmm. with leather straps, um, often homemade. And the shoes were made the same size. 
so that you could put oh. either shoe on e- either foot. There was no left and no oh, right. Oh, wow. Yeah. That seems uncomfortable. <laughs> that would be <laughs> handy. Yeah. <laughs> Made on the right. same last, as they put it. The last <laughs> is the thing that you fashion the shoe on. Now, gumption oh, yeah. is also a Scots word, interestingly enough. So we might have a connection oh, here. And it's it's related to the word gormless. Have you ever heard anyone called anyone called gormless to mean witless or stupid no. or dull? Because no. gorm or gorm means to understand, and this is a three or hundred plus year old word. Um, so wow. gumption means gumption, having a lot of gum or a lot of gorm. Um, oh wow! <laughs> yeah, so that's also a also Scots word. Scottish. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Right. Um, That's and then tarnation mm-hmm. is uh, what we call a minced oath. It's a form of two words. Uh, damnation okay. turned into darnation. It's probably where we get darn, you know, is a, a okay. minced oath for, for damn. But tarnal is a little different. It comes from the word eternal. So people would use oh. tarnal and eternal for infamous. Like there's a line in Oth- Othello by Shakespeare about an, an eternal villain. It doesn't mean that he lasts forever. It means that he's very much a villain. And so eternal plus darnation became tarnation. So in tarnation. So I was worried that I had pronounced it wrong. Like I thought maybe it was a short for entire nation or something like this. And, you know, tar. No, but you will hear people then, because they don't understand the root of it, they will say, what in the nation? And that is a further extension of this this expression. Wow, that is really neat. Thank you for clarifying all of that. Glenissa, thank you so much yeah. for sharing those memories, and uh, good luck with your new house uh, and uh, keeping it as spotless as hers. <laughs> thank you so much, you Great. guys. Bye. Thanks for Take calling. Care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Give us a call to talk about the words passed down in your family. We'd love to hear about it. 877-929-9673. Hi, you have a way with words. Good morning. Uh, This is Julie in San Antonio, Texas. Well, hello, Julie. Welcome to the show. When I was a little girl in England, you know how little girls get fits of giggles where they just can't stop? Mm -hmm. My grandmother would say, you girls would laugh to see a pudding crawl. Well, you know, in England, pudding is not is not custard. It's like a heavy cake, like, say, plum pudding or something like that. And I just couldn't imagine a pudding crawling across the floor. Were, were ants carrying it? Was it possessed? What was going on? <laughs> I thought that was a strange way of putting things. So it was laugh to see a pudding crawl, meaning that you would laugh at anything? Yes, yes. Well, versions of this are about 400 years old. Would you believe that? Really? Wow. Yeah. The original verb was to creep rather than to crawl. Uh, Laugh to see the pudding creep. And originally, the other verb was vex. And the expression more specifically was it would vex a dog to see a pudding creep. And what this meant was that a dog would be frustrated to see food cooking instead of being able to eat it. Now, this is my interpretation. It's really a kind of a tangled history. Because as you noted, a pudding isn't as Americans know it. As people in the United States, we think of a, like a custard pudding, something you eat with a spoon. But this is even older than like the pudding as you described it. This is pudding which is more like a sausage made of innards and other animal bits or some other kind of prepared meat item or a savory pie or some kind of seasoned stuffing a pudding was not necessarily a dessert at all or anything any kind of treat it could just be like a a standard food item uh, about 400 years ago so and then the creeping verb is explained because if it is a sausage or if it is cooking, it's getting smaller, and the dog would be perfectly happy to eat it raw with no cooking at all. But the human has to cook it, and the dog is sitting in there, vexed. The thing is shrinking. The sausage casing is tightening, and the dog just wants to wolf it down. Oh, my so that's goodness. Generally, the, so it's weird, yeah? So it goes from vex a dog to see a pudding creep, to laugh to see a pudding creep, to laugh to see a pudding crawl. 
And then there's another offshoot of that, which is, it means, it's what would shock me would make a pudding crawl. And it means it takes a lot, a lot to shock me. So it's just a little, just a little different still. So it's a strange. And I've never history. heard it anywhere but in England. Yeah, it's very much a Britishism. Yeah, it, it's not something you hear in the United States. You might come across it in Australia, but it is very British. That is an amazing explanation of that particular uh, phraseology. I mean, I I just always wondered, as a, even as a grown up, I thought that is really weird. <laughs> You're yeah. right. It is. Oh, well, thank you so much for explaining that. I I have learned a whole lot today. All right. Take care now. Be well. Thank you. Bye-bye. Share your stories about language with us, 877-929-9673, or send them to us in email. That address is words at waywardradio.org. Our team includes senior producer Stephanie Levine, engineer and editor Tim Felton, production assistant Rachel Elizabeth Weisler, and quiz guide John Chinesky. We'd love to hear from you no matter where you are in the world. Go to waywardradio.org slash contact. Subscribe to the podcast, hear hundreds of past episodes, and get the newsletter at waywardradio.org. Whenever you have a language story or question, our toll-free line is open in the U.S. and Canada. 1-877-929-9673 1-877-929-9673 or send your thoughts to words at waywardradio.org Away With Words is an independent production of Wayward Inc., a nonprofit supported by listeners and organizations who are changing the way the world talks about language. Special thanks to Michael Breslauer, Josh Eccles, Claire Grotting, Bruce Rogo, Rick Seidenworm, and Betty Willis. Thanks for listening. I'm Martha Barnett. And I'm Grant Barrett. Until next time, goodbye. Bye.